and Katrina. I kind of, I kind of go through that, talk about some of that. Um, but that that's a, a you know a prominent area where uh, Black folks uh, have have uh, connected to the city. Okay, Garrick. So, well, and one, let me say this to everybody. You know, I'm I'm facilitating this, but please, anybody can jump in. Okay. So yeah, absolutely. So y'all will have to unmute yourselves when y'all. Y'all do. I muted everybody. There was some background noise. And so um, when you come to ask a question, just unmute yourself and jump in. So, so Garrett, you start off uh, with an Mbongi. Yeah, man. Why, why, why do you start off with that and explain what an Mbongi is? Right. So that was one of the major themes that I wanted to, to, to weave throughout the book. Um, every generation of Black folks, it seems like as far as writing and, and talking about this stuff, going back to David Walker's appeal in 1829, Black folks in the diaspora, particularly uh, in the United States of America, um, have to deal, have to address this question, are we American, or are we African? And today we're seeing these, um, these discussions come up, um, especially in, in terms of the reparations discussion, right? Um, and, and obviously through the popularity of uh, the 1619 Project. So, I wanted to make it abundantly clear uh, where I fall on that position. Um, I agree with our brother, Dr. Ronald Walters, when he asked the question, when did we stop being African? My answer to that question is we didn't, right? And so an Mbongi is a, a, a village space, a communal space, a center and a circle that, uh, that you will find throughout what, what they call the Bakongo region of Central and South Africa, a region where a lot of our inhabitants um, and, and our ancestors who found themselves in Southeastern Louisiana came from, right? Um, and so tried to draw direct linkages, right? Between that Mbongi, that place where the community will come together and decide important matters like marriage, ceremonies, name and ceremonies, take care of, of family business in that communal setting and, um, you know, show how that didn't that didn't die off uh, when we went through the, the Middle Passage. That didn't die off through what we call the Maiafa. That was an echo of what we brought with us. And so they didn't just pull that word out of nowhere when we started gathering um, in downtown New Orleans at a, at a point that they called Congo Square, right? Mm -hmm. Which for us was, you know, a place for us to come and commune while we're in the midst of chattel enslavement um you know singing drumming dancing but also plotting and planning right so you and i before we came on talked a little bit about that piece there is no we yes right um uh, a, a lot of the key planning for that uh G german coast uh river parishes uh insurrection that kicked off um january 8th 1811 a lot of that planning took place at the Mbongis at congo square mm. right um that Congo Square was the same place that, you know, a lot of historians uh, trace the, the direct linkages to the birthplace of jazz. For right, example. a Black music period, right? A period, right? Yeah. Um, but that's something we brought with us. That's something yeah. that as you, you go along and if you, um, if you got the book and you read the book or you, you started thrumming, thrumming through it, you would see a lot of that uh, come through in our, our, um, our uh, recognition of, of Daniel Black's The Coming. Right. Mm -hmm. We went through all of that. Right. All of that pain, all that torture, all of that. But when we got here, we still kept a lot of where we came from. Right. No, we didn't just emerge out of born on the water in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, heading to, you know, Comfort Point, Virginia, 1619. Now we brought a whole lot of history, a whole lot of culture with us. So that was one of the major themes uh, throughout the book. And I, I try to make draw concrete uh, connections between uh, the Mbongis that, you know, our people were um, participating in on the continent and then the new Mbongis we created at Congo Square. So, so let me ask you, so talk about your, your family uh, lineage for, for, for a moment and, and how that helped shape you and how, how, how your family shaped you. Wow. Well, um, I know that's a big question, but yeah, cause that, 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 that is a lot. And um, as far as, as, um, Buku New Orleans goes like like we were saying uh, before we came out before we you know started recording, um, you know New Orleans is a is a 
is a crazy place, man. A lot of stuff went down. A lot of stuff goes down. But we were able to maintain our Africanity. And so, um, uh, and and my my lineage, right, is what I, I drew strength from. But it was going, it being linked up with y'all and being linked up with the folks I got linked up with at Temple and again at Ohio State and being exposed to the stuff I got to read, the folks I got to listen to, the folks I got to sit down and, and you know, uh, soak up. Um, that made me understand and realize some of that, right? So um, as far as direct lineage, um, my grandparents, uh, the, the, you know, the two that I got to, to get close to, uh, they filled me up with a, a lot of the, the tools that I would use later on. And you see some of that stuff come through with stories like who shot the Lala um, in some of the, you know, if you read the homegrown tourist at the end, you mm -hmm. would see how uh, stories listening to my grandfather who would say that he traveled the world twice. He was a merchant seaman, mm -hmm. uh, my grandpa, uh, uh, Leo uh, Roland, and the stories that he would tell me about the continent of Africa been all over the continent, loved the continent, right? Um, you know, it reminded, as, as, so as a, as a young man sitting in um, Temple University's African-American Studies program and my first uh, work study uh, job was in, in that department and sitting in Dr. Malefi uh, Asante's office and having him tell me that when he goes to New Orleans, it feels like he's in Dakar, Senegal, or wow. it feels like he's in, um, it, is, it feels like he's in Nairobi, Kenya, or it feels like he's in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I was able to absorb that because I remember talking to my grandpa about that. That's the same thing my grandpa was telling me, you know, back in the 80s when, when we used to go and, and, and soak up his information. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that it, it kind of got me ready. It kind of got me inspired. Um, and so as I'm writing this book, uh, two of the, the stories that I kind of were two of the things that I kind of put together. One's a short story and one's a play, right? Uh, the short story, There Is No We, um, is essentially about that, that African insurrection in 1811, uh, River Parishes. And if I'm going to write something about that, right, um, and I'm putting it in my own story and my own words, best believe I'm going to put some farriers up in there. <laughs> so I use creative license, right, to find the, the earliest farriers we could go back to. Pierre and Teresa Ferrier um, had a different spelling, you know, more, more closely aligned with the uh, death camps that they came from, F-E-R-R-I-E-R, -R -E -R, and that's how you would pronounce it, kind of like that water we, you know, some, some of us drank Ferrier water, Ferrier. Um, I use creative license to interject them into that story. So the other folks in that story, Cooks and Kwamana and Charles Deslon, those are actual historical figures that, uh, that met up at the and Bongis at Congo Square plotted that insurrection. And then January 8th, um, uh, 1811, over 500 of our ancestors uh, wrecked shop, Mau Mau style, KLFA style, right? Right. So, um, what, 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 for a second, what resources did, when you're doing research on your family history, um, what resource did you just stick with ancestry or what other resources did you use? So, yeah, that, that was for the most part. Um, as far as the stuff on Rivers Frederick that I went to go and try to find and connect those links, I, I had to give a shout out to our, good, our dear sister Lisa D. Moore and the good folks at the, um, the Amistad, Archive, or Amistad Research Center on Tulane's campus. They let me sit up there for a couple of days and go through the, um, the uh, Rivers Frederick papers. Um, and I'm glad you raised that, Kale, because uh, the end notes, right? I'm a footnote guy. I was raised to be trained to be a footnote guy. Um, I was told that in works like this, you want to put the footnotes at the end. So I put them at the end. So those are very, very important. Um, but as far as family history, yeah, pretty much sticking to, to what, whatever we could find on Ancestry. That's how I got, you know, I obviously found out about Pierre and Teresa. And they, again, let's go back to 1847, uh, three decades uh, after uh, that insurrection, but shoot, yeah, I'm gonna use creative license and, so and put them so, in the mix. So when you were doing this research, was that the first time you realized you you found out about Pierre and Rivers yeah. Frederick um, being a part of your family? Yeah, so River, we can't make that direct connection to Rivers Frederick. He was they were from Point Coupe Parish, which oddly enough um, was uh, the site of another really large uh, African insurrection. 
Um, that's on the other side of from the Rivers Parish on the other side of Baton Rouge. That's like in the northeast corner of southeast Louisiana. This is, you know, this uh, insurrection was probably about 40, maybe 50 miles away. You think about the 1800s, that could be two or three days to get across. So it was creative license that I, I put them in there. Yeah, but it was going through. It was my mother having told me that story that, you know, at the time when she told it to me, that Rivers Frederick was our great, great uncle, okay. um, her great uncle. Um, and none of them knew about it. Her, her sisters, like I said, my Paul, his brothers, his sisters, all went to Rivers Frederick Junior High School. And if that could have been that connection, that, I mean, that would, that fired me up. That, that's what, you know, got me going into this, this leg of, of this writing. I was on fire at that point. And so we couldn't make the connection. Um, ancestry might be wrong. Um, there's a, a, a big question about that because, uh, you know, it, his niece was Marie, uh, Mary, uh, Marie Frederick, and that was a popular name. And so if, you know, and, and Rivers Frederick uh, was, uh, uh, his, his parents and his family were sharecroppers on the Drulliard plantation, right? And so we couldn't make that, that actual connection outside of ancestry, but that's what got me fired up and, and got me going on that one. So now you you break your play you I shouldn't say play you break your book into uh, seven seven different acts. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how how you decided how to organize that? Um, so again, I, I'm you know I'm trying to um, capture the essence of uh, my experiences in the city. Um, my experiences having like I said having gone through a bachelor's degree in African-American studies, a master's degree in African-American studies. So obviously I'm gonna try to teach a little something, try not to drown folks um, in, the, in the teaching, right? We've, we've, uh, we've themes throughout some of the stuff that folks might not have uh, heard about. Um, and then, you know, bring in some of the memoir, some of the personal experience, try to dash it with a whole lot of humor. Um, and so in the, you know, in the, the promo videos, I, 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 you know, that's the truth. I really try to leave folks with a sense of uh, all of their senses being touched when they come to the city. I want them to be able to feel the music, hear the food, right? Listen to the art and the architecture. So I tried to break it up with, you know, some storytelling. Well, I wanted to, to lay some, some, some groundwork first. Some, uh, you know, some of the themes, some of the primary themes like, no, we weren't born on the water in 1619. Um, and then, then the Googie piece, the perfect nine to show the primacy of uh, African women, how African women were going to be centered, Black women were going to be centered. So that was a message to the misogynists, right? They're going to, you know, that's us. Right. And we're right. not just going to stick to, you know, one gender or get caught up on gender stuff. Um, and so that that was that was why that was laid out that way. And then the rest of the stories just kind of fit, mixing in humorous stories, mixing in uh, some of the historical stuff, uh, mix mixing in some of the memoir. Like I said, this was a joy, joy, joy to write. And even though some of it was emotional, um, it wasn't tough. It wasn't tough at all. And I wanted to, to kind of break that out so folks can get a sense of we're moving. And then I also wanted to introduce folks to some of the lingo. So that's why you would see uh, some of the chapter headings, what, what they are, words we, words we say, how we say them. Um, so, you know, in the event that y'all end up in New Orleans, y'all can come into what we call our governance structure, the black community, and somebody say, hey, let me get that out. So you're not gonna look at them like they're crazy. You would already <laughs> kind of experience that. You kind of have a sense of right. what we talk about, right? Well, I think you do a great job, man, particularly, I mean, you had me wanting some authentic New Orleans gumbo. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> my serious. auntie Caddy, my I'm auntie serious. Caddy on the line. She she is the the gumbo queen in our family, and she on the line. Uh, drop your email in the chat, bro, and, and she'll she'll figure out how to how to get you some. Oh man, that, that that's awesome. You so you talked to me before we got on too about the play SS Salamanca. Yeah, uh, talk to talk to us about the importance of that. <clears throat> so. So that was another one, right? And so New Orleans ain't all just fun and games. And that right. was another part of what I was trying to express. So the SS Salmaca was actually the steamship that deported the Honorable uh, Marcus Mosiah Garvey on December 2nd, 
1927 from the Port of New Orleans. Um, and as it turns out, right, and I, I kind of, I knew this before, but it never really clicked and connected. Um, Louisiana itself, um, according to Tony Martin, his book Race First, um, in the early, uh, in the introduction, has, a, a, you know, he, he talks about a cache of Universal Negro Improvement Association records that was found. So let me stop real quick. Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey was a Jamaican, uh, staunch Pan-Africanist, came on the scene probably a, a whole generation, maybe two after that term was coined, um, started an organization called the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Um, and they had chapters all over the world. Right. Uh, as part of their uh, identity, was, was one, one guy, one aim, one destiny, right? And one of their key mantras was Africans for the Af Africa for the Africans at home and abroad, not necessarily trying to uh, get a whole lot of Africans out of the diaspora, diaspora to move to the continent, but to have this sense of Pan-Africanism, pride in African history, and maybe get down to doing some business across the diaspora, right? Um, and so he got in trouble. Um, you know, I won't get into that because that'll take me into my master's thesis and beyond and we'll get caught up in that. Um, the fans were looking, as they always kind of look, um, probably his organization probably kicked off what we came to know in the 60s and 70s as COINTELPRO, right? Um, the forebears of the, of the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation said, oh, no, we can't have this Negro talk about uniting all these Negroes all over the world. We got to put an end to that. So uh, they did. And eventually they caught Garvey up on some trumped up federal uh, mail fraud charges and that kind of thing. Um, he sat in the Atlanta penitentiary for a while and uh, he was deported from the port of uh, New Orleans or the port. Of, yeah, the port of New Orleans. Um, and so this story was just my attempt at what they call Afrofuturism. Um, I don't know what that is. I'm still trying to get my head around it, but I wanted to take a step back and just 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 look at what it would look like possibly if um uh influential uh what we call garveyites members of the UNIA supporters of the UNIA mm -hmm. uh knew the time place and date that Garvey was going to get deported and had enough time um to do something about it so again using um using you know Tony Martin's uh, information that Louisiana was a hotbed of uh, the mode they had like over 70, I think. And I could pull the book right now, but that's going to get distracted. Uh, over 70 uh, UNIA chapters in Louisiana. And this is the 1920s, 19, um, you know, uh, right before or after uh, World War II, right before, uh, right after World War I, before World War II. Um, and uh, New Orleans had three active chapters. So if, yeah, if I'm gonna put Garveyites in the room trying to figure out how to spring Garvey, um, I'm gonna put one of my ancestors in the mix. So again, use the creative license. Um, I use my, my great grandfather, uh, Leo, uh, 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 Leo Walter Rowland, um, or Walter Leo Rowland rather, um, and put him right there in it. He was a, um, a, a, a soldier in World War I. I have his picture there and made him like the, the weapons guy in the crew. And so other prominent Garveyites names, folks, were, if they read, the, they would recognize uh, Mama Louise Little, Pastor yeah. Earl Little, the parents yeah. of, of Malcolm X, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, a young, a spry and young Queen Mother Moore was in that room. Uh, another Queen Mother, uh, her parents, um, there was a, um, a longshoreman who delivered the message that Garvey was going to be uh, deported the very next day. I put him in the mix. And so just I uh, had a, a dialogue between them and what that might be able to look like. And so that was fun for me because I it's got to commune creative. with my ancestors. Yeah. yeah it's, and it's, it's short, it's, right? It's, it, it, I, didn't, I didn't go into all of the octopus and the tentacles and the actual throwdown. I just wanted to, to spark the dialogue and see, it, you know, see what that looked like. It's very creative, particularly because, you know, uh, Malcolm's parents, very may well have come into contact with Reverend Easton. Malcolm's parents had been in Philadelphia for a hot minute, and yeah. Reverend Easton had been in Philadelphia. Yeah, for a hot minute. So this very is very creative. I, I really, I really enjoy um, taking a peek at that. You, you have a, you have a, uh, a section on Khalid Muhammad. 
<laughs> yes. And, and also, it's, uh, right after Khalid, you have a section of the, the White Devils. Can you right. talk about both? Can you talk about both? Sure, sure. Because you know, so, we used to always have a good laugh about Yerugu Bolokaja. So. Right, right. And so, if I, if, yeah, you know what? I'm a, so give me one second, y'all. Just give me one second. Because Kel think I be playing when I tell him stuff like this. I uh, hope I can find, I should have had it up. But that's your name in my phone. Kelly Bolakaj Harris. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, again, just, you know, like I said, it, it, New Orleans is a, is, a fa- is a fascinating place, man. Um, all this time, so back in 1993, myself, Kelly Harris, um, y- y'all just saw uh, a B came on the scene, Brian Jones, who gets a shout out in, in one of the, the stories in the book. Um, and uh, some of the other brothers who may, may jump on. Uh, we were all undergraduate students together at Temple University. Yeah, yeah we Nate, were... Nate and Norman are on too. Oh, oh yeah, so I got to talk. I, yeah, yep, yep. So when I talk about who shot the Lala, I remind me there's a connection to Nate in that story. But, um, and so um, uh, we were very fine back in the early 90s uh, of, of young Dr. Khaled Muhammad. Um, he was a, a huge influence on, on a lot of us. We, we had a lot of respect for him and we would get his tapes, <laughs> right? Um, and so uh, to read uh, that book that came out, is some folks have issues with the book, have issues with the author. Um, and to read that he went to Diller, right? There was a connection to him at Diller University, right in the Seven Ward, right? He's from Houston originally. Um, and he was a, a, a Q and Omega Psi Phi, Son of Thunder from Dillard University. Uh, so that prompted me to, to include that, right? Um, a, a lot of, of, of those essays that you will see were actually what I would call book reports that are put in another social platform, uh, Nubian Narrative. Uh, Got to shout out Greg, right, um, for, for having um, drawn so many folks into that community. And shout out to um, uh, Sister Karen Hunter and her team for putting that together. But, um, you know, as, a, as a, a further spark of my creativity over the last two books, I workshop a lot of ideas in their book club. And that was that essay was one of, of the essays that I put together in there after having read uh, that bio on Dr. Collin. And so The White Devils um, actually was a story that I wrote in 1999 back in, in New Orleans, you, you would get a sense of that Midnight Riders. This was one of the last major stories, but I was on fire. 1999, um, uh, August, September, October, November. And so I just woke up one night. I'm working at the University of New Orleans. I'm an admissions counselor. I don't live too far away. Uh, for those in the city, I was off of uh, Lizard Fields and Mirabu. I was maybe three or four blocks down on the street called Wilton. I get up one night and walked to my office at UNO's campus, had a blank screen, and then woke up the next day. Or I, I sat there, wrote all night um, until I had that story, The White Devils. And it, it's, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a nutshell, um, it was a foreshadowing of the racial reckoning that we're, you know, that we, we all experienced um, after, really after the, the, the lynchings of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd. And so what it, it takes place on a college campus, a mystical college campus, um, popular football student or football player um, comes into consciousness and takes a stand against his mascot, the Indians. Um, they, that, that was sparked by having watched an ESPN special the night before about, you know, Native American iconography and how, you know, the, the, the Cleveland Indians uh, had a derogatory image and the Atlanta Braves had a derogatory image and it just clicked on me forgive my french but i you know i gotta say it as i say it if there was a, a team called the new orleans niggas we burned the nation down right right if my mom p- plug your ears mama plug your ears I sorry to use that language but that's what that sparked that so I, I got up in the middle of the night i was like heck no we you know they they doing that to them because they stuck on reservations for the most part somewhere yeah and so i got up went, wrote the story and it was about uh, challenging, um, you know, really Native American iconography and saying, well, y'all, fine, y'all won't have this big old Indian head with a deep red face and a big old nose 
and Big O.T., fine, we're going to call our little intramural basketball team the White Devils. And so that's where that came from. Um, and it's kind of a preemption of these teams and mascots being changed and the Washington Football Club uh, changing their name from the Redskins and, and, and that kind of thing. So before I ask any more questions, let's open it up a little bit. Absolutely. And, and, and see if anybody wants to chime in, any of your family, friends, anybody wants to chime in with any questions. Absolutely. You can, you can either raise your hand or just, just unmute yourself and get in where you fit in. And I got a, I got a couple of things, a uh, special plan for folks that are on. So let's okay. get to these questions. Anybody up? Now I know all these people ain't shy. I thought I had a, saw a hand raised at one point. I don't see anybody it, up. All right. So yeah. you cherry. Um, yes. My cousin Donnie got a question. <laughs> Euteria. Yes, ma'am. I'm listening. Hello? Got to unmute. Hold on. Okay. Can y'all hear me? Yes, yes. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Hey. Okay, so happy birthday, my Aries brother, and Thank happy you. birthday to your uh, your wife. I'm a seven war hardhead. Yes, ma'am. And I'm also uh, in Nubia. I'm a yes, Karen Rebel, and um, I just want to say kudos to you on oh, writing this you. book. Thank you. And getting that information out there. Thank you. Because, thank you. you know, growing up, I grew up around the corner from the bottom line. So I was on yes, tour in Roman. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, so, ma'am. You know, so many people, when you say you're from New Orleans, they like, Oh yeah, the food, the party. <laughs> but it's like, baby, it's so much richer than what you even understand. And so for you to, to be putting this information out there for um for people to, you know, to to do a deeper dive is um is greatly appreciated. Yes, ma'am. And um one other thing, buku is our French word. There you it's go. Not it's not our Vietnamese. it's not our yeah, it's not our belize the less uh <laughs> neighbors. That's French. You know how we got that French and that Spanish mixed in there. Yes, you know our our banquets and you know, so but again, the, the wonderful culture, I appreciate um you putting this out there. Thank and you. I just want to ask you really quickly, mm -hmm. as you were um Doing the research for for the book, mm -hmm. did you find anything that kind of paralleled or even intersected with the Gullah Geechee um, culture? So, um, so it's like, thank you for that question. Um, I wasn't looking, but it's out there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I hate to do this, but uh, our brother, Dr. Carr, gets really, uh, he gets to us. And so, nah, I, babe, do you think, do you think, do you think? Um, you will find a lot of those connections in this book. Um, Joseph E. Holloway's edited Africanisms in mm -hmm. American culture. So they make some, you know, he makes connections in the essay uh, in that book. Uh, but that's that wasn't really my focus, was mm -hmm. uh, the Gullah Geechee. But, mm -hmm. you know, um, that's stuff that we, like I said, that the coming did not uh, destroy in us. So um, there are definitely concrete uh, connections in obviously how we prepare food, uh, language use, syntax, um, uh, language structure, uh, some of the customs that that we kept and have. Um, but yeah, that that wasn't, you know, my focus was pretty much the crib, so to speak. Okay. And, and I just asked that because, you know, from the moment we open our mind, we know our people. So we either say, oh, you from the city, or right. I have people that don't know. They'll say, oh, what island you from, or who right. are you Gullah? Right, And right. so that's why, that's why I kind of threw that out there. But um, again, thank you so much oh, for, no, thank uh, you. for presenting this to the world. Thank you for your Hello. support. I really appreciate it. Absolutely welcome. Hey, Donnie? Yeah. Cuz. Cuz. I don't have a question, bro. I just have a comment, man. I'm, I'm so proud of you, bro. Sit tight, I'm bro. Here. I'm on a, uh, of course, you know, I'm working right now. I'm down here on these drums or up here in Memphis from where you at. But man, the, the, the title, Buku New Orleans. Yes, sir. It's something that 
knowing you from childhood. Yes, sir. That's the perfect cross pollination. <laughs> like <laughs> you would, you you gonna use a colloquialism, right? Yes. To highlight something that's uh. A phrase I coined a little while ago, so fully sophisticated, but that's you. Oh, so wow. kudos to you on the book. I love you, bruh. Love and everybody you, that's on the call, hey to everybody from up here in Memphis. I'm going back to work, cuz. All right, cuz. Hey, hey, wait, hey, can you hang tight for one minute? Yeah. All right, hang tight. Kale, let me do something right quick. Okay, so uh, AZ, my dude, we'll come right back to you. So hold yeah, on. Ad, brother Az, just give me one second. So. Um, this is, uh, I, I guess, one of the earliest poems uh, in the book, Soul of a Drummer. Pale faces may have taken our drums, but they don't know us. They can't touch our souls. It showed up one day, Ooh, one no. season, no rhythm, no rhyme, no reason. It snatched up a few of us, a couple at a time at first, and sent them to the lands to the north, far, far away from us, far away from the drums. The pale faces may have indeed taken our drums, but they don't know us. They can't touch our souls. More and more pale faces came this time. They brought some faces as dark as ours. Those familiar with our ways of knowing, those knew who, our, who, knew, who, knew, who knew our drums could speak. They snatched up more and more and took our bodies, our drums, but still couldn't touch our soul. A few escaped and lived to tell the tale of boats as big as the sky and along with cloth, dragging our people off the fates and places worse than hell. Forgotten by the ancestors, the guys in the drum, dismembered, rebuilt, remade, and return to God to pale faces. They knew where our strengths lie. They knew what we knew. They knew that for generations we spoke through our drums. The collaborators had names like Mungo John and Don Antonio Mingo, twisted and rotten to their eternal shame, may they never ever be forgotten. They told the pale faces to take our drums, but still couldn't touch our souls. Those pale faces also had a young one among them. This one dreamed of lands of gold in the West. And with calculating eyes twisted by greed in the bowels of, in the bowels of those sky boats, he plotted his scheme. Visions of a new world haunting his dreams. So off this one set, ever in search of this land to go, no matter the cost of a life or the cost of his soul, he lost his eye shade. His kaaba was lacking. This went for him and the others and the monarchs who backed him. Word soon spread, that, but we didn't believe it. How could we? No way. Then more and more went missing, kidnapped by others led astray. The pale faces now know they had to take our drums, but still couldn't touch our souls. As other villages found out, the speaking drums had to go. Black, the blacks with the pale faces were forced to make it so. The grains came and went. So many of us were taken. They had to build dungeons they called castles. Kingdoms fell and scholars were shaken. To them, this was becoming more than annoyance, more than an annoyance, more than a hassle. They wrote manuscripts, letters, and treaties uh, but the instruments they used weren't dipped in paint or ink, rather the blood of, of their people. Falling on deaf white ears, the blues were ignored, and the damn dungeons got deep. The pale faces took our drums, but they don't know us and can't touch our souls. The pale faces did what they wanted to those black bodies. Women, children, and men, no quarter was given. No one came to save them. Some saved themselves and planned to save others too. Once away from the wayward blacks and damn pale faces, they knew just what to do. They gathered the circle, in a prayer, in a plea, beg to who was listening to let their drums speak. The pale faces talk, took our drums, but they didn't know us. They can't touch our souls. Most were entrapped and took a myopic journey where millions died, were tortured, and suffered unspeakable agony. They were brought to strange land, sometimes lands of different drums, sometimes separated from their physical being, literally missing limbs, eyes, virginity, dignity. But with their souls and epic memory attack, they adeptly used all of that. Every ounce of it called upon the God that ever towards the refuge they still seek. And again, ask the gods and the ancestors to make their new, uh, to make their new drums speak. But the, the pale faces took our drums, but they don't know us. They can't touch mm -hmm. our souls. Held in this bond, hey. some escaped once more. Other persisted. Every action that was taken oh, in, 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 okay. each in, in its own way was an act of resistance. <laughs> See, those pale faces may have taken our drums, but they don't know us. It can't touch our souls. So in a small backwater hamlet, still known to this day for lust, violence, or death by bandit, money, mosquitoes, the ever-powerful gun, a group of these Africans found a small spot in the sun where they would gather together to listen to them talking drums. Our new drums are alive, speaking to our soul. By the grace of God and the ancestors, our drums are talking once more. Talk on, Fadana. 
Wow. That's the earliest yes, poem in the book, brother. Yes, wow. sir. And it's relevant because it's still it still happened today. Like um being a being a jazz musician, right? People still discount how intelligent you have to be to be able to do what we do, right? And so it's easy for the to get little Uzi Vert on the record and get him on the television, right? They're yeah. still trying to they're still trying to co-opt our culture and they found the dollar and they're trying to give us back four quarters. Yes, sir. Right? That's that's it's it's so it's poignant, it's relevant. And man, I man, I don't even know what to say, bro. I dedicated that to you, brother. Love you, man. Cause. I feel I feel so much, I feel so much smarter, bro. <laughs> that's from that you 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 must have came up with that when I was playing on Ed or Charlie's Chips came from K and B. What's happening? What's happening? Love you, man. Cuz. Let me get on, let me get on the stage, bro. Love you, bro. All right. <laughs> that was dope. That was dope. Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, brother ass. Brother ass. Hey, What's up, I'm man? In, I'm in London. Um. And I'm in Nubia with Derek. And um, yeah, we've been dialoguing a little bit. Um, I got this in the mail yesterday. Uh, so you got to cam gonna... up, brother. <laughs> I'm look, let me just tear it open right quick for all y'all. So you can see my new, my new John, as you like to say. Look at that. Look at that. New book. Well done, brother. Well Thank done. You, brother. Well done. Well I done. I'm so happy to get this right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to absorb this slowly and enjoy it and i'm going to be linking with you as i go through it so we can have a little bit more dialogue and understanding because i've never been to the united states yes I've sir seen new orleans on in many movies in many you know some of my favorite shows i've been seeing new orleans in in a, all different kind of settings so now i'm going to get a, a real understanding of what what is really like from a from a personal perspective yes sir so i'm really happy to have this in my possession in fact let me just yeah, man, I think you signed. Yeah, you signed it for me as well. Thank you, brother. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, thank you, brother. So yeah, this is this is a this is gonna hold a special place for me. Garrick done signed it for me. See it there? See it there? Yeah. Yes. So my people, we're from we're Igbo. We're from Nigeria. That, yeah. That, that wretched country called Nigeria. So if you all know the history of Nigeria, it's um, brother, as you're digging through your history, man, and the more that I find, because I was born here in the UK. The more that we find out, you know, we're, we're just trying to build the bonds and build the bridges. Um, I was in the British Library this afternoon for another book reading session with um, with the author of this book, Paddy Doherty, the Irish yeah. the historian. Yeah. And, um, it's some deep history that's gone in in Nigeria that people still don't understand. And, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, trauma that, you know, people of Nigerian diaspora here in the UK are still going through. And uh, this this book sounds like it's gonna be a a joy to read, and I'm gonna enjoy it very much. I hope thoroughly. so, brother. I yeah, hope man. so. So I wanna big Thank up you, man. I wanna big you up. Yeah. So just wanted to join you and then just support you and keep supporting you. i you know how I'm on. I'm on the Twitter warrior. So I'm gonna be sharing <laughs> this with everybody, everybody. Yes, sir. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be finding little pieces of knowledge, and I'm gonna be dropping it on people. That's there how I go. do my style. So. I'm gonna read this and I'm really gonna enjoy this, man. And I'm gonna link back with you when I'm done. And we keep and we keep building. And I just wanna wish everybody a, a good evening. I'm here in London, I'm supporting you all. So, you know, you got friends all over. Yeah? I see. You got friends I over say. Here, so. Bless I up. Say. Bless Sante up. Sana. Thank you, brother. Thank Bless you. Up. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah, thanks, brother Ass. Thank you for that. Um, any in, uh, more questions? Anybody else? Hey, this is Nate Garrett. Yeah, Love man. You, brother. Proud of you, man. Uh, <laughs> it's, and I appreciate you so much, man. So much I've learned from you throughout the years. And I was thinking about it as we were going over. I think uh, when I taught, when I used to teach, one of my lectures came from you. And it wow. Was no, no two sign, no purchase. Whoa. So I had to teach the Louisiana purchase. But I remember our conversations around that and around the history of New Orleans. I, I, but I, I know I attribute that quote to you, no two sign, no purchase. But Wow. Let me ask you this, man. One of the things I'm most impressed with is the way that you, uh, I guess in my, my estimation, kind of unboxed yourself. So I always say if you can write, you can write anything. Like you can write an essay, you can write a song, you can write a, 
poem, you could write a play. If you're a writer, you just you, you could just write. Um, so I was really, really impressed with the way you just stretched out, right? Yeah. So what was your what was your decision? Was it a hard decision for you to do that? Did it come <laughs> natural? Because I think sometimes um, you have to consider how people see you. So I know you as a heavyweight scholar. You understand what I'm saying? Um, and sometimes if you're a poet, it doesn't really look like you're a historian. But so how did you make a decision to kind of just stretch out? And were, was it hard for you? No, it, it wasn't hard, man. I love you, brother. Um, and, and like I said, uh, um, if we do get a chance to talk about who shot the Lala, you you hold a, a special place in that, in that story, man. Um, uh, it wasn't hard at all because, like I said, I, I just was fired up. And, you know, I felt like I was in touch with, with the ancestors, particularly uh, Rivers Frederick. Um, and, it, you know, I just felt like if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Plus, this was a chance not to have to talk about, um, you know, qualified immunity and not to have to talk about the, the lynch and the Sam Holes and not to have to talk about uh, shake out the Diops, you know, 15 point plan where you got to be super sharp and you can't clown and you can't joke. Right. So this was a blessing to be able to clown, joke, maybe share some stories, have maybe have some folks shed a few tears. This was a joy, man. And so it wasn't difficult at all. And the stories would just come like they came in 1999. That story, Midnight Rider, man, I, I get up out of bed in the middle of the night and go sit at the kitchen table and word paint like the words would just appear on the page like i'm painting like i'm painting something man and so that was just amazing that was just i was just in that moment in that groove and enjoyed every minute of it man even the even the tough stuff that i hadn't thought about in decades uh that was all enjoyable man that was all enjoyable that's something but that's what alice walker says too the characters come oh. to her you know what i mean because I wow. imagine it's the same sort of process. Hey, hey, wow. wow. It's, it, let me ask you about the play. Are, are you planning on getting that workshop or? Um... So it's a couple. I have a couple of different plays mm -hmm. in there. Um, one, um, so yeah, one was um, SS Salmaca, right, about the deportation of Marcus Garvey. Um, there was one called The King of Ethiopia, which touched upon another theme that I was really trying to weave back and this theme is, is basically don't judge don't judge a book by its cover and that was sparked by you know the teachings the maxims the precepts the say by yet a tahotep you know that that stuff that we used to talk about back in the day that fifth um fifth dynastic period in ancient egypt uh teaching um in the earliest verse one of the earliest verses that medu nefer right good speech um is as rare as gemstones but can be found amongst the maidens that pound grain or the maidens at the grindstone, depending on that translation. And so, no, never judge a book by its cover, right? Um, and so uh, that was a, a play that that was kind of based and, and spun around that, but also um, Haile Selassie's uh, state visit, um, the king of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, his state visit uh, to New Orleans in, in 1954, uh, June 24th, if, if I remember correctly. 1954. So, um, and then, and another uh, say by eat was also the importance of intergenerational uh, dialogue. So that that's a play that covers that. Don't judge a book by its cover. Um, intergenerational dialogue and the importance of that in and around um, a, a, a unhoused guy named Itchy, who was actually a real person. Itchy was one of our our boys in the neighborhood, right? Um, had a you know had a problem with with drinking mostly. I don't know what else Itchy was on, but he did live in the neighborhood that's an actual person. And I wanted to give Itchy some dignity and some voice uh, in that play. That's another one. Um, and then another one was one of the ones that I wrote, um, couldn't sleep one night back in 1999, was on a, um, you know, a, a, a work trip, had written another story, got home, uh, couldn't sleep. It was a windy night. It was a full moon night. It was a cloudy night. And I find myself at Cafe uh, Dumont on uh, on um, uh, Decatur Street, right across from the St. Louis Cathedral. And I wrote that other play, Secret Sauce. So it's three different one-act plays uh, in this book. And so, you know, I'm open to 
anything that I could keep creative con control over, just, you know, we'll look for the avenues to be able to do that. Hey, cool, man. If I run across something, man, I'll let you know. I'm working with a brother here that's got a, uh, he's got a, he's got a one-man show on John Coltrane's Love Supreme and how he came wow. to write it. So he's workshopping wow. it now. That's why I asked you. I'll make sure I connect y'all. Oh, thank you, Nate. Thank you. Thank you, brother. All right. Um, Reverend Wright. Rev. I also want to thank you for the book. Let's start off digging in Kelly's soup. Khalid Muhammad was, you said, a strong man of Omega. Iron, irony. And it's so is honorable Louis Farrakhan, a Q. Uh, wow, Rev. I, I didn't know that. Yep. Wow. I have some questions for you and your family. Yes, sir. Not, not uh, academic. Well, there's one thing I want to say before that. Yes, sir. Walter Brueggemann has coined a phrase as he talks about prophets, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S. Mm -hmm. If you look carefully at the writings of the prophets, the genuine prophets are all poets. Mm. Wow. Mm. Wow. Brueggemann said, finally, which is what I feel about your writing. Wow. Finally comes the poet. Wow. Wow. Who can join music and meaning and words. Wow. Your family questions are, do any of you, as I looked at the recipe section, did, did any of you know Rudy Lombard? So that uh, my mother is on and uh, my auntie Cabrinthia is on um, and I, my, my brother Jaron is on. I don't know if they uh, heard you. Did y'all hear Reverend Wright? Do, do auntie you Caddy? Hmm? Yeah, does anybody know Rudy Lombard? Y'all know a Rudy Lombard? Chef. He has a book on New Orleans recipes. Mm -mm. I have to look that up. I don't think we do, Garrick. Um, Rodia, did you hear that question? That's my Auntie Lithia. The only chef we knew was Leo Walter Rowling, one of the best in New Orleans, <laughs> and that's my father. <laughs> um, that's what he did for a living. Um, he was raised by all women, and he was um, a built-in housewife and a built-in built cook. But I'll have to look up the gentleman that you're speaking about. <laughs> I think I asked this in a previous conversation on Sunday. Did any of you ever hear a record by, if not in person, Louis Armstrong before he got his grouchy when he was a soprano. Before he got his grouchy voice, <laughs> he was I a, have it. Your family member? Oh, yeah. I haven't. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I haven't either. But my our sister Cabrinthia still lives in New Orleans, and maybe she can visit that Louis Armstrong Museum and park down there and find what you're speaking of, sir. That's my mama, Ro Rodia. Um, uh, Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> and happy birthday again to Garrick and Danita. Happy birthday. This is a wonderful birthday gift for Garrick, I'm sure. One he'll never forget. I was bragging about Garrick and Kelly yesterday, no, Friday at Shaw University and seated across in front of me with somebody you all know from Temple, Dr. Stacy Floyd Thomas. She said, we were all at Temple together. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, Red. I didn't know you were gonna have ladies. By the way, Derek, your mother's name is Fafaria. 
Yes. In New Orleans, they pronounce it Ferrier. <laughs> Mrs. Ferrier? Yes, that's Garrick's last name as well. I know, I knew that, but I didn't know if you had the same last name. Yes, Ferrier Charlton. I know how privileged I am to meet you. Number one, just to meet family members, but number two, how privileged you are to be on this misogynist Sunday recording. <laughs> Kelly, Kelly, Kelly Nimlin will not allow women anywhere near the link. I started to give it to Stacy, but I said, no, you're not going to get on me. Back to oh, Thank Rev, you. you stopped you that on a Sunday. Rev, we stopped that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there is a question I wanted to ask Garrick and a comment I wanted to make. Reading uh, his book, from the time it arrived, looked like every evening I, I had to read something. It was more and more exciting every evening. And it reminded me of so many people, places, and things in New Orleans. I left New Orleans with Garrick 48 years ago. So it brought back wonderful, wonderful memories. All the way back from my elementary school years, all the way through, and even now. So I want to thank you, Garrett, for all of those memories renewed for me on people, places, and things. Even the Huckabuck lady is in there. And I, oh. I had to laugh when I saw the title, the Huckabuck lady. I don't think most people know what a Huckabuck is. Right. So you have to tell them what that's all about. What's the Huckabuck, Gary? <laughs> right. So um, I want to thank you for uh, having those labor pains uh, 49 years ago today. Um, uh, Huckabuck is, is called a frozen cup, um, uh, water ice uh, for, the, for the Philly crew um, and the, the Jersey crew. Um, all the same thing, sugar water with some flavoring that you freeze. And the Huckabuck lady was the, you know, I guess she's called the candy lady in some places, uh, a, 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 a lady in the neighborhood that was sell, sell snacks, sometimes to children, sometimes to the adults. Um, and uh, that was another place for folks to kind of uh, have community. Um, and a funny, you know, I, I kind of uh, touch upon that a little bit in that Squire story, um, where the, the young man um, uh, is tricked into uh, biting into a pickle pig lip. Right. Uh, that was a memory of mine because my cousins did that to me <laughs> early on. Um, but yeah, you would you would get whatever you would need from the Huckabuck lady for sure. <laughs> and if I can say one more thing, I because I want to give other people a chance to speak. Oh, you're the mom. You, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, OK, I take that privilege. <laughs> but one of the uh, characters that I thought was so humorous from the moment I met him in your book was Jimmy Joe. Yes, ma'am. Jimmy Joe, I mean, he was so funny. And not only was he hilarious, you know who he reminded me of? Who? My father. <laughs> I, saw, I saw my father all in that Jimmy <laughs> Joe character. So tell, <laughs> tell us a little bit about how, why you created him and, and what made, what gave you the inspiration for Jimmy Joe? Uh, oh, all to a legend. Right. So, um, yeah, that that was I hope it came off the way it was supposed to. Uh, that was actually a, a old, a, a probably a crude homage uh, to Langston Hughes's uh, Willie Simple character that he serialized in some of his earlier works. Um, a, a bit more crude than the, the elegant brothers, uh, simple. Um, but I also wanted to weave through uh, that idea that you never really should judge a book by its cover. Yeah. Um, and so folks might have challenges. Uh, Jimmy liked to sip, right? But he was, you know, he still made sense sometimes. Um, and he was a, a, a stalwart. So um, the, the first time I, I think you, you see him is in that story, New Year's Eve which is comical. All, all of the stories are comical except the last one. Um, the other one, uh, Take Your Drunken Ass Home, it was, was actually an ode uh, to Big Al Carson, who I used, to, who I thoroughly enjoyed going to see at, at the, um, the Funky Pirate down in, uh, he had a standing gig at the Funky Pirate on Bourbon Street. I loved uh, going to see Big Al and that was his song that he would close his shows with. 
Um, and then you would also see him in the, the Funky Butt Philosopher. And that was, uh, that story, um, you know, kind of gave a uh, voice to, to, to Jimmy Joe, but it was also the one crack that I had um, to give voice to, you know, the LGBTQ community. I always mess up that acronym. Forgive me for that. But that was the, you know, because that, that's a LGBTQ bar, or it was when it was open. Um, and so Jimmy Joe, you will find him wherever he was at. He could hang with whoever he was hanging with as long as he got to sip, right? He did sip. <laughs> um, and so that also uh, was, was an ode to uh, Metal Nefer being found um, uh, amongst, uh, you know, common folk. Um, and then in the last story, that was one of the, the tie-ins to one of the, the major thing, another theme that I, I tried to weave throughout the book. Um, this one was more subtle. Uh, so if you, if you get the book and you see you, one of the prominent, first prominent pictures you will see is of the Superdome, right? Um, and so you, that was my, that was mom with y'all moment. Um, you can't write a book about Black New Orleans and not at least honor and acknowledge um, that, that uh, the New Orleans Saints uh, as a football team to Black New Orleans. So that was my way of seeing, I, I see y'all. And I went back and forth about adding a, a piece about uh, how we all called out of work, millions of us called out of work the Monday after the Saints won the Super Bowl. But I figured that would be going too far. And I knew that in some of the pictures, you were going to get a whole uh, display of Saints paraphernalia. Um, towards the end of the book, um, I was trying to get folks to go with me on the journey. So yeah, we could protect the dome. But as you read some of this stuff, it might be some other stuff that comes up that we should probably start to look at protecting too. So in the last, the last time you, you hear from or see and, and, and engage with, uh, with Jimmy Joe was in Red Beans and Rights, right? Where he passed away, he made transition, but folks are honoring him as an ancestor. That's a, again, an echo of the African culture that we brought with us um, from the Bites of Benin um, to, to give a shout out to, to Brother Oz from the, the, the Bites of Biafra, uh, from the Bakongo region, right? Um, that's something we brought with us communing with our ancestors. And so, yeah, that was really uh, meant to be uh, uh, my take, uh, my 2022 take on Langston Hughes' Willie Simple character. Tried to make him humorous, but also tried to make him uh, be somebody that, that we would be able to recognize and engage. He was comical. He, he, <laughs> he was a great storyteller. He cut up. Jimmy, Jimmy Joe cut up. He cut up that whole story. Very engaging. <laughs> He commanded, he commanded those crowds. They were just fascinated with it. As long as they bought the next round, he was good with that. <laughs> right. And, and he wasn't dealing with rounds of hucklebucks either. He had the... No. 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 Uh -uh. no uh -uh. He, he had the real deal going on. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Love you, mama. Love you. Love you, son. I know my sister Caddy is on the line. If she's... If, okay, she can hear us. I know there's a very special... Oh, memoir yeah. that you wrote in the book that she would like to speak to. Yes, ma'am. Does she want to go now? You ready, Caddy? Oh, sounds like she's she's not unmuted, huh? No, she has to unmute. You know how to unmute? Um, I could try to do it. Let me let me see if I could do it for her. Can oh you no. Hear me? Yeah, you have to unmute, Auntie. Garrett. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining. This is the wife. Hi, wifey. Hey, 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 Ms. Pro. <laughs> happy birthday, Garrett. Happy birthday, have... baby. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you. Y'all have given him the best present. He was smiling early this morning, getting up out of bed. I said, what you smiling at? And he just looked at me. I was like, uh-huh, on the clock. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I just want to thank everyone for coming and, and joining in on this set today. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, uh, for hosting this forum. And Eric, I'm so proud of you. You're doing your thing. Love you. You're doing what you love to do. I'm trying. I'm Keep trying. Doing. I'm trying. We couldn't doing. hear you. you we couldn't hear you. You have to unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, Rev. 
turning 49. Yes, sir. Your memory. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, be simple. Not really. J E S S E. Thanks, and use character. Yes, sir. Yes, E be simple. Yes, sir. And he dropped the E off the end of it. Says, so just be simple. Somebody else, somebody else is speaking now, but you have to be. So what the hell are you saying? <laughs> okay, so let's. Um, Brian, uh, Brian, you had a, a question. Do you still have a question, Brian, or comment? I did. I think I did. I'm not sure though. But let, but first of all, Garrick, happy birthday, brother. I love you. Thank man. you, brother. I'm Thank so you. so 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 proud of you. Um, I have to admit, I haven't got the book yet. I'm gonna get it soon. Oh, it's, um, it's all good, brother. No, nah, but I, like Nate commented, I'm impressed by people who can weave different styles of of like it's like they, you know jazz is a four letter word, but it's all it's all music, right? You know, whether it's an essay or right. a poem or a story or a play or whatever. Yeah, what did I say? I wanted to ask you something, and I don't know if you did research on this or not. I'm fascinated by these port towns. Yeah. Um, 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 Mobile, New Orleans. Yeah. No, I don't know if you researched this or not, or if you're going to do it at some point. What is peculiar about that particular port town, about New oh. Orleans as a port town? What's peculiar about that as opposed to the other, the other stops um, our ancestors made un un unwillingly and unknowingly so in many cases? What, what, I, what I would say, um, without looking at Charleston, right, without looking at um, you know, some of the port cities in the Caribbean, because that, that wasn't the first stop. New Orleans, by, for, for sure, wasn't the first stop. They stopped uh, all over the Hello, diaspora. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Can okay, you hang okay. on? Can you hang okay. on one second? <laughs> just yeah. Give me one, yeah, just give me one second. Give me one second. So um, so I don't, you know, uh, what, what was peculiar uh, about New Orleans and why certain things could jump off Really, you know, um, not just because we carry stuff with us, because we carry stuff with us everywhere we went. It's really how the French uh, approached us, man, um, and how they approached that. They, 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 they never shook that them attitudes. And, and you know, when they started colonizing the continent, um, you'll see a lot of this stuff in uh, um, Amadou Habate uh, Bay's writing. Um, certainly, uh, the treasures of Wangren. Um, you'll see that that the French really were just supremely arrogant. Um, you know, that and that style of how they handled the Africans they enslaved, uh, certainly in Haiti came back to bite them. Um, in other parts of the Caribbean, they uh, transported this cold noir, which gave the Africans uh, under their lashes uh, a lot of, well, a lot of liberties that the Brits weren't going for, the Portuguese certainly weren't going for in Brazil. Um, and so, for example, um, the the uh the ascension holiday i guess that's um i guess it, in catholic tradition right and I, rev would have to correct me and i, I hope he can correct me um but that was i, I want to say that was maybe after uh, the christmas holiday and before lent um they would let africans kind of hang out and kind of you know kind of not have to be as worried about that oppressive sugar cane that they that they were needed to to uh, Teal. That's how they got to go um, to the, that section of New Orleans that, that came to be called Congo Square. Um, the attitude that the French took was why on earth would these Africans want to leave and go live, the, uh, go live in the swamp um, and go live in the swamp like I, I touched upon in the Squire story in the story of Bras Coupi mm -hmm. or Bra Coupi, um, the, the uh, insurrection and maroon leader. Um, that, that was later on in Squire. A lot of folks never heard of Brock Coupe. Um, you know, the, it was that French attitude, that laissez-faire, kind of hands-off. Um, they ain't really trying to leave us to go live in the swamp. Um, and we French. Everybody wants to be French, right? And so because of that, um, the, the Africans in New Orleans got to mix, mingle, got to marry, um, you know, got to work their own kind of land. And no, they never stopped being African. And a lot of times these folks were warriors, right? Uh, from the Bacongo, uh, from like I said, the Bight of Benin. Um, and uh, they, would slit, they would slit your throat. Um, if you, you know, if you slept too long, if you got too drunk uh, during Mardi Gras, the Feast of Lent, or if you cut up too bad, yeah, you, you, got, you would get caught slipping. And so that's what, um, you know, that, that uh, insurrection of 1811, 
was really all about. And I tried to model that story about the, you know, around the KL, KL, KLFA, Kenya Landed Freedom Army, uh, the, what they would call the Mau Mau. Um, and it used a lot of Gerald Horn's work, uh, Mau Mau in New Orleans, obviously, uh, Baba and Googie's works, um, and, and some of the other stuff. But I think that's, that was part of it. Obviously, you get the mix of all of the Africans from all of the different places, but they weren't um, necessarily as brutalized in every sense like they were in British colonies and in uh, Portuguese colonies. Um, Thank you. They got Appreciate a chance to, to mix and mingle. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. I, I, before I go to the next questions, uh, Kurt had a question. He's driving, so he couldn't, he had to, he, he sent it in. So I'll read Kurt. All right. Question. He says, Brother Garrett, please discuss your thoughts on the impacts of the post-Katrina displacements, current gentrification, and other forces on the cultural rhythms and Africanisms your book captures. Whoa, all right. So um, we were stuck uh, during, during Katrina. It was uh, 18 of us. I, I won't walk through that whole story again because um, that that I get to be a drain. Um, there were 18 of us, uh, my family members, uh, stuck on a, a 610 interstate uh, for over 27 Nine. hours, but we, but we were <laughs> we were stuck there during the week. Um, you know, the storm hit that Sunday. We were stuck. Eventually, getting on um, uh, buses and uh, headed to Houston, right? Um, and my job at the time, um, I was the Louisiana district manager for uh, Unite Here. Um, I, I, so I was a, a union organizer. I was Union Man Garrick, like I talk about in the book. And I was responsible for, uh, you know, uh, hotel and restaurant and uh, workers at the, uh, the, the Lowe's Hotel, the Fairmount Hotel, uh, the um, Ernest and Morial Convention Center, uh, folks who worked uh, for Airmark Services, who worked at the Superdome um, and at the... Um, at the um, Smoothie Center or the Smoothie King Center, right? And so uh, part of what I saw uh, during that year, uh, traveling back and forth, trying to uh, bring folks back to work who had gotten dis dis dispersed and, and displaced uh, the New Orleans diaspora, as we like to, to call it, the 504 Fujis, as we really literally looked like as we were, you know, drying out and coming off of, of, of bridges and interstates and that kind of thing. Um, trying to figure out how to balance all their competing interests. Folks who stayed needed to go back to work. Folks who left through no fault of their own had to come back to work. Um, and so that was challenging. But that, I, I talk about that in a couple of places in the book. Um, and then, yeah, gentrification is a shock, brother. Um, wow. Uh, I, so I, I, I have a picture of the St. Rock um, seafood. Uh, I guess it's a restaurant now. Um, it looked like it could be in the middle of South Beach or any other posh kind of place you could think of wherever y'all living at, right? It, it probably looks like stuff that that's at UPenn campus or Temple campus, I heard uh, now, or wherever you, you would think. And so if, if y'all were able to Google and look up what that looked like back in the 90s, right, um, a place that, you know, Gigi, our, our grandma, Grandma Ida, who would be everybody grandma if y'all ever got a chance to hang out with her, that's Grandma Ida, right? Um, where they would go seafood shopping. I remember being brought to the old, um, to the old uh, St. Rock Market and um, my uncle telling me and my brother to stick our hand in the jaw and it was a snapper turtle in the jaw. Like he would, you know, play with us like that. But if you would be able to look at what that looks like then and what that looks like now, um, amazing. Um, the last time I went to New Orleans was this, uh, January to do that primary research I was talking about. The last time I had been before then was in uh, 16, 2016. And um, I was heading to my grandma house and they were tearing up the roads and I had to drive. I guess I'm driving down Galvis, heading to Franklin to turn around to come back up a street so I could get uh, to her, her house on Mandeville. And so I'm driving past Roman Street right, in St. Rock Park. And so those were particularly uh, violent places. Um, I remember bringing uh, folks home back in the day, back in the early 90s, bringing folks uh, from Cincinnati home, bringing folks from uh, uh, um, other places when we were at FAM and we would hang out with 
uh, Moli, Ma Alethea, Ma, uh, if, if that's the Karen, um, my cousin Karen, uh, you know, her, her people, my, my, my auntie and them, and they stayed on Roman, and you would hit the gunshots, right? And so I remember that. And so we, we drive, I'm driving down that street. Um, you know, it's it, the summer is wrapping up, so it's, it's getting to be pitch black. It's probably about 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. And white folks are walking on North Roman Street and near St. Rock Park walking their dog in Birkenstocks with their iPhones in their ears. Like before Katrina, you wouldn't have saw them walking them streets in the daytime, let alone late at night. And so gentrification is something we we dealing with. Um, they taking up areas and moving us up out of that. But if you go back far enough in the history, um, you will probably see that those areas became, you know, black areas after white flight at some point in time, right? Maybe, you know, maybe after World War I, World War II, something, right? Um, so these things run in cycles, but that's still shocking to see uh, that, right? And so I have a picture. And so when we went to this by the St. Rock or by the uh, St. Rock market, um, they, you know, they were out there hanging out. And I was like, wow. I mean that's that's that's, that's a shock. That'd be All like right. the Badlands in Philly, Kale. Like okay. you would see them walking through the Badlands. Like, wait, what? Right. <laughs> what? Right. Yeah, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what that wasn't happening. Look, that wasn't happening by Roman. That wasn't happening by no St. Rock Park. Certainly not by no Claiborne and Caffin in the lower nine. No. But today, yeah, you you might wow. you might be shocked. All right, uh, brother Adi Soji. Baba. Yeah. Hello, 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 <laughs> hello, hello. I call everybody uh, in Yoruba, that's good evening. Um, the first thing I will say is uh, our grandmothers will tell us that anybody who keeps the thread of family is a treasure to not just our family, but to the society. The first couple of pages of that book shows the importance of family in African tradition. Uh, from your picture, one of which where I saw you, the biggest man being carried by his grandma, you know, really cracked me up. <laughs> and it goes to show that um, no matter how far you go away from the continent, you always remain African. Because yes, throughout sir. the thread of that book, um, one thing was evident. The Africanness in you is evident. You don't need an African card. You, you wear it, you say it, you believe it, and you've, and you've also written it. So I would say that's kudos to you. And one more, one more important thing before I leave you guys. Um, Chino Achebe once said that a man who writes that if it's not there, the book speaks the language of the people, is that people. This book can be given to anybody that comes to New Orleans on the first day they arrive and say, take, read. Wow. And the next time you meet up with them, you can essentially say, oh yeah, I know that place. Why? <laughs> because I've read it in that book. I know this story. Why? Because I've read it in that wow. book. So that book is essentially a talk or guide, sense of the uh, sense of the word of New Orleans. So, my brother, I congratulate you on a beautiful piece of art. Wow! It's not just a book; it's a work of art. Wow! Yes, it is. Thank, thank, thank you, very, brother. Thank, thank you very much for writing it. And the onus is on us that have read it. I've read it parts in parts. But the part I've read enough is enough to say, you know what? You need to stand on the rooftops and tell people, go read this book. Wow. You know. Wow. It Thank does you, justice brother. to New Orleans. You're welcome. Wow. You're welcome. Say, out of soldier, can you tell the folks where you're from, man? I am from uh I am from Lagos, Nigeria. I am currently residing in the UK. The reason this story in itself uh when you talk about the uh, enslavement and you refer to the french the portuguese the british now the problem with 
while I can't speak on the French and the Portuguese, I can speak on the British because my grandfather, my great grandfather, who happens to be Obaku Soko of Lagos, was a victim of salt and the story of the slave trade as it impacts the world. Now, the British, when they banned slavery in the United Kingdom, didn't tell the African continent that they banned slavery. So what they still do is they went out of their ways to kidnap people. So my great grandfather was the Oba of Lagos at that time, and he ensured that the slave trade was not transferred to Lagos. But in order for the British to get into Lagos, a lie was told that the reason we're going to bomb this place is because slavery is still happening. And as a result, they did. They imposed one of their stooges. But I digress in the sense that it's not about me, it's about you and it's a celebration of your work and what have you. But I'm just trying to use that story to, to say, whatever has transpired in the past, while it is a trauma, we should use that strength that we're here to build for the future. We've I got kids coming through. And so we have to do what? <clears throat> Interlock them. Because that is what white supremacy does not want to happen. The idea of retracing steps so that you find out the truths. I mean, there are some painful truths, but there's some hard truths that were turned into lies, you know. So again, in celebration of what you've done here, I was listening to your mom earlier and she reminds me of my mom as well. Yes, so sir. Yes, sir. No matter how much you grow, you're still a baby in the face of your mother. I say oh. So I say oh. Uh, kudos to her. She's done a very fine job with raising you as a gentleman. And it's a privilege and a honor to share this space with you you and everybody oh, no. your family your friends and uh i must say good evening to everybody and uh happy deliberations once again congratulations yes thank you brother that's thank you brother testimony. thank you brother let's go to uh brother akeem yeah. you hear me? yes sir well, Demetra, I was off mute, man. I want to say thank you again for not only sending the book once, but sending it twice because the first one got lost. So I appreciate that, man. Happy birthday, more importantly than that. And also thank you to your mother and, and your wife, man, for being gracious enough to allow you to give us your time. You know what I mean? So I'm, yes, I'm definitely sir. grateful for that. The book is amazing from what I've read so far. I actually got two bookmarks in there because <laughs> i started off on one of the pieces that you recommended for me which was 1208 saratoga yeah yeah that was that was that was brutal brother that was brutal mm -hmm. but that that definitely you recommended it to me just based off of what you learned about me so far and it's yes sir a small amount of time that we've gotten to know each other and i can tell you it resonates not only from just new orleans where you're from but man it it has home in new york and just my experiences too growing up as a kid in queens you know, it resonates on the, the block and Woodside houses where I'm from. And then also in Queensbridge, where I spent my last couple of years living in New York, ultimately yes, before sir. I moved to Arizona. So reading that, man, it transcends New Orleans and, and it could yeah. touch anybody that's living in the inner city and living under certain conditions in the day to day yeah. navigating through this country, man. Yeah, absolutely. But absolutely. I just want to come on and say happy birthday. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. I say, oh, Asante Sana. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Brother Battle. Brother Greg. Hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from Cleveland, Ohio. This has been a wonderful year of reconnecting my life experience. Your book uh, brings me into feeding my desire to gather my family's stories, making sure that uh, the lessons that we carry in all of the areas, every city that's represented here are so similar and that we need to uh, 
continue to uh, find ways to capture them. Just, just a quick quick question, please, please. I just wanted to know, do we have to get butt naked or? Hold on, y'all. Look like do, do, do we have to get butt naked? Just a quick question. That's it. That's it. Oh, to get a turn in your, uh, in the tools on the bottom in your reactions, when you click on that, there'll be a button that says raise your hand. And when you click that, then Kelly knows. Don't, 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 don't worry about trying to address that. I think that was somebody trying to uh, mess up our Zoom call. Yeah, they trying oh, to really? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, anyway. Um, my question for you is, when you write, yes, sir. How do you stay on focus? Because when I write, mm -hmm. so many things come, and you write them all down, and then you look at it, and it's like so fragmented. How do you get to pull that focus, or is that just part of the process of gathering those stories? So um, in, in intellectual writing, like the first two books, I, I write out an outline and then I'm writing the stories in the outline. So the outline becomes like a living kind of outline. Um, and then, you know, by training, I'm an attorney. I'm a lawyer. Uh, they t t taught us outlining mechanisms and devices to use. I use a lot of that in that writing. For this, brother, I, I would get up out of bed. My wife could attest to it. She'd be like, oh, God, here come them lights again. And I'd get up out of bed, go sit in the kitchen and just get to a piece of paper and wouldn't stop until it stopped. Um, it just kind of flowed. It just kind of came. Um, and and the, the, the folk, I found the focus um, in the stories as they were coming out. Um, you know, like I said, it would be kind of difficult to sleep, kind of difficult to not be sitting somewhere taking notes. Um, and so it, it was enjoyable. Uh, but it, it did get to be a, a bit tricky to navigate, um, especially when you got a day job and this ain't your day job. Were there ever times that you would write down things, somebody would review it and try to tell you that's not the way it goes, that that's not what they remember? And, you know, uh, my brother and I sit down and we live in the same house. Mm hmm the same day, same circumstance, but we see it two different ways. Does that that ever affect your so, family? So not, not so much um, because I, I just put these to, to these stories to this book. So I haven't, I haven't gotten that feedback yet. I haven't gotten it. I know that I use uh, creative license um, in some of the stories to make the stories flow, uh, especially, um, you know, when I'm dealing with family members, ancestors, and also, you know, that story I keep talking about, Who Shot the Lala, um, that's one of my favorite stories because I'm particularly close to Grandma Ida, who, like I say, would be everybody's Grandma Ida. Um, but, um, you know, that 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 really happened, but that wasn't in the time and space that that happened. Um, so the lesson that I got from Who Shot the Lala, that actually came after I uh, my freshman year, or during my freshman year at Temple. So I started out at FAM. If, if you follow the story, um, I was looking at trying to enjoy New Orleans for this last little bit before heading to Philadelphia uh, to go to school. Um, but that in reality, um, I'd already gotten to Philly, already gotten in, in the study groups with Brother Kelly Harris, uh, Brother Nathaniel Norman, who you heard from, or uh, Nate, Nathaniel Thompson, who you guys just heard from. And um, we were in a study group studying um, uh, Chancellor Williams' destruction of Black civilization. So I'm already on fire, but this is, I'm with brothers that's on fire too, outside of my brother Eugene. So there's other brothers that I'm on fire with. And uh, this was in the Mount Airy section of uh, Philly. So Kelly had to go a different way when the study group would break. Me and Nate would head a, another way, kind of heading back down south. Uh, Nate took me to this restaurant called Ofria's vegetarian restaurant right a vegetarian spot they had some of the best wraps you could ever eat um and so, <laughs> um and so uh i i say you know what i'm gonna be vegetarian and so i decided to be vegetarian i started eating off uh red beans and rice off the ali's food truck 
and got into tofu, which was nasty, but I was still trying to eat it. And I come home, and I, but I'm homesick, right? So I get home, uh, get back to New Orleans, and my grandma's sitting there, and it wasn't her gumbo that, you know, I got my lesson from. It's actually her white beans, and she was frying some chicken. And she said, <laughs> hey, baby, how you doing? I'm good, grandma. You know what? I'm vegetarian. She said, oh, yeah. Okay, come grab a seat. And before I left, I tore up them white beans, <laughs> tore up that chicken. and But the lesson was, cool out. This could be cool, baby. You ain't gotta dis. You, you ain't gotta. You know, is it, you. She understood that I was fired up. She understood that I was, you know, coming into information. Uh, for me, when I was coming into it, it was like a fire hose. It wasn't like you sipping clean glasses of water, as we say in Nubia. It's like somebody cut on that fire hose. And so, yeah, Wade Nobles, Baba Jetty. Uh, Malefia Asante, Kariyamu Welsh Asante, Maru, who just passed away, my Marimba Ani, I'm getting turned on to all these people and all these ideas, and I'm fired up, and everybody should be with me right here, right now. And Grandma said, no, eat these white beans and chill out for a little bit. <laughs> That's, but, that, but that was my lesson. That was very humbling, and that stuck with me. But that wasn't at that Mardi Gras setting. And Shan, I remember Shan having that conversation Um but hers probably was a, a, a year after mine. Um, but we did uh, sit at my grandma's table. We did get drunk off that uh, peach shishi wine, that peach, um, uh, what they call um, uh, moonshine, right? Um, that was Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is wild, but we didn't go nowhere that night because we didn't leave that table. Um, and we did talk about my papa. So that stuff happened. Just, the, you know, some of the other stuff kind of got blended in so i use creative license but i'm sure once my cousins start reading stuff i'll be hearing about how they remember stuff differently thank you so much everybody for your patience um blessings to you all i've touched your lives in different ways at different times and you never know how or why but i'm so glad to be a part of the history and bringing back our connections. Yes, sir. I say, oh, thank you. Sante San. Thank you. Uh, let's just a second. I have to admit Norman back in the room. Okay. Okay. I, I had to enable the waiting room so we wouldn't get bombed anymore. Uh, right. Any other uh, comments or questions? Oh, Garrett, you had an aunt uh, that, that was going to uh, say something? Yeah, so if, if we can't connect with her and if she can't hear us, um, she's talking about a song for free. Can you hear me? Can oh, hey, hear me? yes. Hi. Hey, hey, Auntie. Love you, love you, love you. Love you, Auntie. <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for the beautiful song you wrote for um, Frida. Yes, ma'am. Your cousin, ma my daughter, our love, beloved Frida. And we, I just want to say your book is just amazing. <laughs> thank amazing. you, Auntie. So many beautiful stories, and thank you again. No, thank Love you. you. Love you too, Auntie. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Other uh, other comments, questions? Yeah, y'all. This was a blast to write. I had a whole lot of fun, but uh, even with even with stuff that I hadn't thought about in decades like the libations my grandpa poured after sending us to the community, uh, after sending us to the Circle Food Store, me and my brother, Jaron, who was on the call, uh, <laughs> right before my uncle's second line was kicking off and we had to go find that port wine. I hadn't thought about that in decades, bro. <laughs> but that was a pleasure to, that was a, a joy to write. Congratulations. Um, that was a joy, uh, but that was a true story. And then, yeah, so to go ahead and, and, and put this out here before we leave, Yes, uh, prayer for a frozen mule is a true story. Putting the <laughs> putting the ten year statutory uh, limitations on federal drug trafficking aside, um, I'm a broke college student at Florida A&M. Ain't got no money. Go see my uncle Kevin, and instead of giving me money, he gave me a sack of weed. And so <laughs> I freak out. I'm nervous. I try to put y'all in the in the back seat of that car with me, with my seatbelt on. Right, I'm in the back seat. <laughs> with a seatbelt on, freaking out as cars going by, nerves on bad, um, <laughs> right? That's a true story. So I, I didn't I didn't shed no names to protect the innocent, 
Boy, yeah, that, that really went down like that. Like a good lawyer. <laughs> man, man. <laughs> But Garrett, man, the, the 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 book really is excellent, man. It, Thank and you, it's, brother. It's a Thank it's an excellent um, creative way um, to weave history and and, and culture, and it's yeah. a celebration of, of your family and and, and the culture yeah. in New Orleans. Yeah. You know, the African culture the in, in New Orleans. It, Hopefully, it, I pulled it off, y'all. Hopefully. You did, man. Yeah. You did. Cool. You did. Yeah. Kudos to you, brother. Heartwarming. Heartwarming. Kudos to you. All right. Well, um, I, I think I, we took up enough of y'all time. Um, it is Palm Sunday, right? Let, let's um, all give Garrick, everybody unmute. Let's all give Garrick a, a good hand clap and celebration. And, and, yeah, and congratulations and happy birthday. Congratulations. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Happy, happy birthday. birthday to all both of right. you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. You. Thank y'all. Love y'all. Hey, happy birthday, life. Garrick, and happy birthday to you. Thank y'all. Yeah. This is Norm, man. Congratulations hey, on the book. And Thank happy, you, brother. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, I will yeah. definitely make sure to get into it because it sounds like that you were definitely um, writing That's about it. traditional African philosophical thought and pedagogy yeah. as it manifested itself in, as it manifests itself in New Orleans. Yeah. So that's the you, point, brother. brother. Yeah. That's the point. Congratulations to you. Thank you, brother. I, I appreciate care. that. Thank y'all. Love y'all. Congratulations. Love, you too. Love all y'all. Thank y'all. Man, thank you, Garrick, man. Hey, man, thank y'all. And um, I don't know if y'all can see my T-shirt, but I got a good Louisiana brother on the T-shirt. Uh, he oh, was stand up Louis. so we can see it. Stand up and Huey <laughs> P. Yeah, Huey okay. P. Okay, yeah. My uh, good Monroe, Louisiana brother. If he was here to read the book, I'm sure we have uh, yeah. some deep discussion yeah. and debate about uh, cultural nationalism, pan-African nationalism, scientific socialism, Marxism, but like I said, revolutionary nationalism. Nav revolutionary nationalism, right? But he's a good brother for my role, so I had to represent. But thank y'all, thank y'all so much. Thank y'all. Huey P is actually from Monroe. Well, yeah, that's why. Yeah, that's why I wore the shirt. That's mm -hmm. why I wore the shirt. It's been awesome. Yeah. <laughs> right, See you next time. All I'm right. Gonna... See y'all. Next one. All right, peace and love. Y'all have a good one. Awesome. Peace, love, and light. I'm Jason Derek, I'll send this awesome. video to you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And thank y'all. We love Happy you. Happy birthday. We love you. And have thank a good day. Bye-bye. Y'all too. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 You too, Danina. Have a good birthday. Bye. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. <laughs> Go party. Bye. Go party now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Gag, man. Good All right, job. brother. Thank Great you, brother. Job. Great job. Thank y'all. Awesome. Thank y'all.